I wanted to talk a little bit about the verse, and I came across this verse several months ago, and this phrase in there, beholding the glory of the Lord. I said, thought to myself, what, what is that? And sometimes as you're reading the scripture or studying, um, it's good for us to dig in to understand it. So if I were to ask you, just give me in your words, what does it mean to behold the glory of the Lord? That's kind of how I approach the scripture often with questions. So we're going to start out by answering the question, what does it mean uh, that we all with unveiled face? So what is, it, what is he talking about there? Then we're going to talk about beholding the glory of the Lord. And then we are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. We're going to talk about that. And then we're going to finish with this line about the Holy Spirit. And so we're going to see what the Spirit's role is. And, and while I was studying this, in one of the commentaries, it said that this is the richest statement in all the Bible, how believers grow. And so, interestingly, we've had some messages recently on sanctification, and so I thought, well, I guess God wants us to do another one on sanctification. And so here we are uh, to look at His Word on, on this verse today. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for Your work in drawing us so that we would be your children. We thank you, Jesus, for how you've saved us by your perfect life and work on the cross. And now we want to look, Lord, at your word, and we want to understand how it is to, that we become more and more like you, Jesus. I pray for me just that I would be clear with your word, and I would not add anything or take anything away, but it would be your words today that would speak to your people. And I pray that you, Holy Spirit, would take the words from our ears and apply them to our hearts as each person has need today. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so I don't know if the kids look, if they need to be dismissed, but uh, looks like they probably already headed out, so that's good. I usually, I think that's the first time I've ever said that when I've given a message, so I usually forget that part, but now they're gone already. It doesn't even matter. So <laughs> anyways, uh, so let's uh, move on to, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the context. And this, these are the previous verses to what our scripture is today. And so we'll read those through to talk about the context. But if you have your Bibles open, you'll see uh, chapter three is about the new covenant. And so it's Paul's talking about the old covenant and the new covenant. And so the Old Covenant had glory, as we say, but the New Covenant far surpassed that. And so that's what we read, and then we come to these verses. And I think these verses are helpful when we're talking about uh, the veil, and you'll see what I'm, I mean as we read these through. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold, not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened, for to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted, because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And so we're seeing what Paul is doing here, uh, talking about the covenant. I should just give a simple explanation. A covenant is an agreement between two parties. And the covenant motto that we find in the Old Testament that God has given, it sa he says, you shall be my people and I will be your God. God binds himself uh, to his people in a relationship of love. Think of what the beauty of that. We just sang, oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus, right? So that, the, that God would reach out to us and want to bind us to, into a relationship with, uh, of love with him. And then I was reminded when we do communion, we often use the text in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty five, 25, where Jesus says, this is the cup in my blood, right? Do this in remembrance of me. And so this is the new covenant. 
It's about the blood of Christ. And I found it striking when I read this. Uh, it says, to this day, whenever uh, that the veil still remains over the, and I think that sadly for the largely the Jewish people, except for a remnant, uh, they still have a veil over their, over their heads because they have not accepted Jesus as the Messiah. So the old covenant was being brought to, the end, to an end. In the new covenant, only through Jesus there is freedom. And this freedom is brought about by the work of the Holy Spirit. This is our, if you have your bulletins, I've given you an outline to try to help uh, you keep track of where we're headed. And so this is our first point. And we've already talked about this, but this idea of having the veil removed. And on the next slide here, we have, oh, this is our text. That we're just, I'm, I've underlined it each time we come to a new point to just point out which part of the text we are, we are working on. And so we're working on this part, idea of the unveiled face. And this is what we just read. Whenever, some, whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. We just read that in 2 Corinthians 3.16. So here we have our answer. Faith in Jesus' perfect life and his death on the cross to pay the penalty for sin takes the veil away. And so this comes, you know, to an obvious question. In any message, I don't know everyone very well, so we always have to ask this question. Is Jesus your hope alone? for this life and the next. This is the phrase pastor often uses when he baptizes people. And so when we talk about this veil being removed, if you're not in Jesus Christ, if Jesus is not your Lord and Savior, then there's, there's a problem because you are in unbelief and you are an unbeliever. And so it's good for all of us to ask ourselves this question, is Jesus our hope alone? And if it is, we do not have a veil over our face. In fact, we have confidence and freedom in Jesus Christ. And in studying this, I learned that when Moses in, in the Old Testament, you know, this is all this veil is, comes from the Old Testament. And we see that Moses, when he went before God, he took the veil away because he had confidence and freedom. And what a beautiful thing that we as believers can have confidence and freedom when we go to the Lord. And this verse is a good one to have in memory because sometimes we, if we doubt uh, where we're at with the Lord because of our sin or because of something in our past, we need to remind ourselves of this verse in Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> so the second part, I'm very excited to talk about this idea of beholding the glory of the Lord because... This is uh, what, I, what really captured my attention. And before we, we talk about beholding the first word in that line, I just want to say, um, is it okay for us to behold the glory of the Lord? And while I was studying this, it came to my mind this hymn that we sing, Holy, 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 right? And in that song, there's a verse that says, Though the eye of sinful man thy glory may not see. And I think that uh, sometimes we maybe think too casually about how we could just go before the Lord. Now, in Christ, we can. But without Christ, uh, we cannot just uh, go in and behold Him. And so I think it's important to keep that in our, in our minds as well. And so... This idea of beholding, or this word beholding, I wanted to just spend a minute on that because you could say, look at the glory of the Lord, but I don't think you would be getting the full meaning of what the text is saying because this word beholding has the word hold in it, right? So I would say, look at the glory of the Lord, but more than that, keep looking or fix your eyes on the glory of the Lord. And when I looked up in the dictionary just to see what it would say on, on beholding, it said to that this was, uh, let me read it here uh, if I catch up here in my notes. Often used as an interjection with exclamatory force. And so we see this in, when creation 
uh, in the creation account about beholding what God had created. But, so I would say it like this. Look at the glory of the Lord. And not only look, but keep looking. And so it's, it's, not, it's not just a, oh, I'll take a quick casual glance, but it's, there should be some excitement in our voice when we say, look at the glory of the Lord. And so our next slide here, we have asked the question, what is the glory of the Lord? And this definition was in our adult Bible study material when we went through 2 Corinthians. And I found this to be very helpful. And I'll read it here. It is the sum of all he is, and its resulting beauty, magnificence, and splendor. It is the opposite of that which is boring, drab, lifeless, and blank. And so if we are to behold this glory, and this should change us into his image, this is what we need to think about. Well, what is the sum of all he is? And so when I started on this journey for this message, I went to the attributes of God. If you, if you know, there's you know, books for studying. There's one book, Systematic Theology, and I have one by Wayne Grudem. And so it takes all the verses in the Bible about a certain subject, and sometimes that's quite helpful. So my first thought was, maybe I'll use the attributes of God, and we'll go through that. And that's a beautiful study, but I've chosen to go in a different direction. But I would just encourage you, if you have never been through a study on the attributes of God, that's very helpful because there's a danger, I think, for all of us and society at large to say, oh, I believe you know, my God is like this. He, he wouldn't do this, but, but this is how he is. But who's to say they're right, right? Only we have the word of God to, to take, we have to take scripture to really know who God is. And there's a danger of making, in a sense, an idol, a God of our own uh, mind of what we think he is. <clears throat> and, and when I was studying the attributes, I'll just share this. You know, we sang about the love of God and it was God's intention to 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 show us love and there was a beautiful um, so many beautiful things I saw in studying but one of the ones and these attributes are communicable they call it so we are we should share these attributes and one of them was on the wrath of God and I thought are we supposed to share the the wrath of God and the definition for wrath was he intensely hates sin okay so think about that. That's important, even as us as Christians, to hate sin, right? And how wrong it is for us to say we're a Christian and yet, you know, we laugh at a dirty joke or something. We participate in sin, right? And so you can see how even the wrath of God, it, it's important that we also hate sin. And it's always the most important to hate our own sin. And I think that it's usually easier to hate other sins that we see out in the world. And so it's good to be reminded that we are to hate our own sin. But I, the, the direction I want to go is to say this, is that what God is like, so we want to behold His glory, and so we need to know who He is or what He is, and, and the answer is Jesus. And we know that from Scripture because, <clears throat> well, I just want to point out we're moving on to talking about being changed into His image. And I, I'm using the point here to say that we want to be changed into Jesus' image. And we know that from Scripture. In Hebrews 1, 3a, it says, He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. And I thought it was good for us to consider that because sometimes there's a danger in to think of the God of the Old Testament and, and Jesus being different. But here we read it, he's the exact imprint of his nature. And so I think that's good for us to, to be reminded of that. And then in Colossians 2, 9, we read, For in him the fullness of deity dwells bodily. Believers see in his person and in his works what God is like. And then... Uh, Another name for Jesus is the Word. And so we know this uh, from in the beginning of the book of John. We read, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
And so John, we know, is speaking of the Son of God because in verse 14 he says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And so an important point, you know, I don't know if they still make Bibles that are red-letter Bibles, uh, where Jesus spoke in the New Testament. They had that in red letters. But I'll say to you that all of the Bible is Jesus' words, not just when He spoke in, in the red letters. And so I think it's important to remember that the Word of God, this book that is for our instruction, is Jesus' words. And the next line in our text today that we want to look at is this idea of being changed from one degree of glory to another. And I noted in this text, even before that, it says we are being transformed, right? So it's not instantaneous, like it's a done deal when we become a Christian, but it's a process. And so we are on this uh, idea of uh, progressive sanctification. And it's a process that we go through. <clears throat> the goal of the Christian life is to become like Jesus. And Paul had this text that we can read now, and I just really want to emphasize some points in here about becoming like Jesus. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And so I just want to point out the importance of some of these words in here that we're reading, uh, forgetting what lies behind. Okay, Now, some of us have sinful things in our past that uh, can be, we can be reminded of or we can be troubled by, but Paul says that we are to forget what lies behind. I think that's an important part. And then he talks about pressing on and straining forward to what lies ahead. And I think when you think about your own life and your desire to be, to look like Christ, to be like Christ, uh, can you say in, that it's true about your life that you're pressing forward, that you're straining forward to, to be like Jesus? And I think it's good for us to be challenged sometimes just to, <clears throat> to really uh, help ourselves to grow. And we, we ask the Holy Spirit to convict us and help us to, to continue to grow in this life. And so the last part of our message today is talking about the Holy Spirit and looking to the Holy Spirit for help. And this comes from the last line in our text, for this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. The Holy Spirit's activity is the major characteristic of the New Covenant, and the transformation of believers is wholly attributable to His work in their lives. And <clears throat> after I thought about this, I want to say that it's not contradictory to say to press on and to strain forward and yet to give uh, the this Holy Spirit credit. And the reason is because the Holy Spirit gives us the desire, right? Why would we have this desire to want to be more like Jesus? That's part of the Holy Spirit's work. And yet there is a part for us to play. And the Holy Spirit sometimes prompts us and convicts us of things, and then we need to uh, make a decision whether we will work with the Holy Spirit, yield to His leading, or whether we will uh, go the other way. And so... That's important for us to think about. And then other work, I, I should say the Holy Spirit does so many different things in our lives, but we're just going to highlight a few that are dealing mostly with sanctification today. So the Holy Spirit purifies. When people become Christians, the Holy Spirit does an initial cleansing work in them 
making a decisive break with the patterns of sin that were in their lives before. After the initial break with sin that the Holy Spirit brings about in our conversion, He also produces in us growth and holiness in life. I was thinking about my own life. I've shared, some of you know, I was raised in a Christian home, and I, my parents, I believe, did a great job in leading me in the right way. But when I was young, I was rebellious. And so I went far away and was led into a sinful life. And I should say I chose sin. I wasn't just led. I was uh, maybe led by Satan and my own sinful flesh. But I remember when I made a public profession of faith, it was like I was closing a door that I couldn't go back anymore. And I remember feeling like I would kind of like to leave that door open a little bit because I probably let, I love my sin. And, but I, but I, I had made a decision that at that point that I would publicly tell people that I was turning from my sinful ways and following Jesus. And so I would just encourage all of us uh, even to look back at your own life. But if you haven't made a commitment to the Lord to, to look at certain sins, and for me it was uh, my addiction to alcohol. And by God's grace, it's been about 35 years since I've had a drop of alcohol. And so that was a, a sin that I was, with God's help, uh, I broke that pattern of sin, and that was that closing a door. And, and yet I'll confess there were other sins that took longer, sins that I had you know, back then. But by God's grace, over time, uh, those sins are, are gone, or in the sense are in the past, I should say. And, and today I'm working on different sins, so it's, it's an ongoing process, so I'm not done. But I think it's good for us to think about that, yes, we need to make a break from sin when we become a believer and we need to to follow jesus and this scripture i don't have the scripture here he brings forth the fruit of the spirit galatians 5 22 to 23 those qualities that reflect the character of jesus and many years ago this is a scripture that i memorized so the fruits of the spirit are love patience Love, patience, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I wrote it down because I thought, well, if I'm under pressure, I better be able to look at my paper. And that's what happens when you're under pressure a little. But anyways, that's a good verse to have in, in mind because I think sometimes we, I found this true in my own life, is sometimes I always think about this is a sin you should not do. Okay, do not do this, do not do that. That's part of sanctification, right? Killing our sin. But are we as focused on putting on the qualities, the character of Jesus Christ, right? So I think that's, that's uh, it's important for us to remember that. And so that's something that if we want to have this image to look like Jesus, that's something that we need to be working on, those fruits of the Spirit in, in our lives. The Holy Spirit opens our eyes to understand Scripture more and more. This is called illumination. We must understand that as a fallen people, we are naturally born blind to God, hostile to Him, and not comprehending the depth of depravity or the provisions of His grace. The process of being transformed into the image of Jesus Christ will culminate in believers' glorification. When Christ will transform our bodies, into conformity with the body of his glory <clears throat> and so we see where where god is how he's sanctifying us and where the end is right and i have one more slide talking more about that but i wanted to just share a, a story that i heard uh, watching i was watching listening to a little bit of country music on youtube you can and uh, there were uh, merle haggard if you've heard of him as a pretty famous country singer well his son was on there being interviewed and he was talking about Merle's mom which was this guy's grandmom uh, grand grandmother and he was talking about how she prayed for him year after year year after year and he was so rebellious um, he was married I know at least three times 
And so we see how he was, uh, he was running far away from the Lord. But during this interview, this man said that his, this mother of Merle Haggard was like Jesus in a skirt. And at first I kind of was taken aback by that. But, I, but what he was saying was that she looked like Jesus. Okay, And so I think what I want to just say is that if others looked at you, would they say, you look like Jesus? Okay, And I think that they said that about her because of her commitment to pray. Um, she was very humble, gentle, and some of her other qualities. And, um, but I would just challenge us in that way, is that we, people should see us that we look like Jesus. And, and I know none of us can do this perfectly. And where we fail, we should be open. You know, I've had it at times with my employees or with somebody I do business with, I've had to say, you know, I shouldn't have said this. And so we try to correct things when we, but even some of those opportunities, they were a little bit shocked that they thought, you know, in my mind, I was a little bit harsh or abrupt with them. But the fact that I would go to them and say, I felt, you know, this wasn't right, this was wrong, that got their attention, right? Because that doesn't happen too often, I, I guess. And so <clears throat> I just think that that's important for us. And this last slide talks a little bit more about uh, the end of, of this sanctification process. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body but the power that enables him to sub by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself and so <clears throat> i wanted to to talk in the response part and this is what really convicted me um, why would why would jesus or why would we be look, why should we look like jesus right why is that important and it's not just so we can look good, right, to the world, but it's because there's a purpose. And in the very next verse in chapter 4, this is what Paul writes of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He says, therefore, having this ministry, that is the new covenant, or you could say the gospel, by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. Okay, So <clears throat> I just want to leave us with this idea that God has a purpose for sanctifying us and to changing us into his image. And it's for the gospel message. And I was reminded, I gave a message once on this Luke 19 verse 10 that says, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost, right? So if this is, you're trying to carry his image, is this important to you? If this is Jesus' mission, this is our mission. This is my point. And if you think of the Great Commission about going and making disciples, and that's also in that same vein. And so I just want to challenge us as a church. Um, yes, we want, to, we want to be changed more and more in Jesus' image, but we are doing it for a purpose. And then I got to thinking about our plan is to, because of, the, of, of our church is growing and we can't fit all in one service, that we want to build a building. We're going to be talking more about that in the future. But when we talk about things like that, it's important for us to think about um, why would we build a building, right? We do it because we want to reach people for Christ. We want to disciple people. And so us elders or the leaders, we can't do this without you guys have to be on board. And you guys, this has to be your mission your passion. And I think it's important to remember that when you attempt to do something like this for God, that there'll be opposition. The devil, you know, they're, they're, I think that we need to be in prayer because we can't just think, assume that we can just throw up a building and everything will be great. And I think we really need to, lean, you know, to ask the Lord for help, to ask the Lord to protect our church as we do this. And, uh, we, the other point that I would just leave us with is that we're doing this for God's glory and not for our own glory. And there's always a tendency 
in all of us to, oh, we might start bragging about Good Shepherd Church, and we might start taking the glory and talking about our pastor and, and these kind of things. But I think that God will not bless that effort to build that building and to grow this church if it's for our glory. And so let's just be checking ourselves always when we talk with others to give the glory to God. And so hopefully I've challenged you. If you want to look like Jesus, you need to be carrying that message of the gospel. That's what Jesus was about. He came to seek and save the lost. That's our mission. And so in this coming week, make that your your goal to uh, talk to someone about Jesus and tell them the good news. Let's bow our heads in prayer. <clears throat> our Heavenly Father, we're just grateful that we have been given a mission. We have been given uh, the Great Commission to reach out of these walls to help people see you, Jesus, to help people see their need, even to see their sin, to understand that they're in a hopeless situation and they're destined for hell unless they look to you, Jesus, to forgive their sins, and they also turn from their sins and follow you. Lord, we're grateful that you don't give up on us and that this process of sanctification is an ongoing process. We just pray that we would be forgetting what lies behind, but we would press on and, and, and also straining forward to this goal. I pray that this goal is important to each one here, that we would not just be passive or non-committal about this goal, but this would be something that would be important to us. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would stir us up in, in our desires to be more like you, Jesus. Thank you for this message, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.